So I've titled part three, Truth Out of Lies. Now you can't really get truth out of lies. However, the discovery of lies can lead a person to find the truth. As I know with probably the case with many people, um, case, certainly the case with myself, I found out while in the world, I found out about the 9-11 uh, inside job. And from that, it led to next new uh, led to other things such as chemtrails, vaccinations, all sorts of different things until finally somewhere along the way, you know, if, if, you, if a person's open and honest and humble, that they will eventually hear, hear the gospel and, and the, the more important truths that we know. So that's how the discovery of lies and the exposure of them can lead a person to a knowledge of the truth. And we're going to unmask some of these lies today. So my first scripture is in 1 Timothy 6, 20 to 21. Paul instructs Timothy, he says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Now we know Paul was instructed in those days, and he instructed Timothy because of the Gnostic heresies that were coming in, that they were mixing heathen philosophy with the truth of the gospel and causing a lot of confusion. And what, what does it say that they are? Oppositions of science. It's in opposition to scripture. True science never opposes scripture. He's saying this because he, he feels, Timothy may feel that this is a trivial matter or maybe a light thing, but he's saying, he's saying avoid this stuff. Keep it out of your, keep it out of your mind. But what, what does it lead to? The next verse says, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee, amen. So this, these oppositions of science or knowledge, falsely so-called, they lead to, a, to, an, to an outright denial of the doctrines of Christianity. And as we're going to see here, the spinning globe orbiting the sun has led to a wholesale denial of the, of the gospel and of the, of the word of God. As we saw in the other messages, just, just to summarize the origins of the, of the two cosmologies, we saw that the spinning globe model has its origin in heathen philosophers, such as Hermes Trismegistus, Plato, Pythagoras, Aristarchus, all of these people believed in a globe, some heliocentric, some geocentric. But, but the globe, both geo and helio, have their origin in heathen philosophy. And we saw the biblical model had its origin with Moses and was seconded by all the prophets of the Old and some in the New Testament too, as we're going to see at the end here. The true science of cosmology was brought through Moses and the, Old, and the prophets. Now, we saw in the other sermons in 1517 was the beginning of the Reformation, where the Bible was given as an open book to the world, translated into many languages. And the, the response of the Catholic Church was getting Copernicus to publish his Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres, which we saw was under the order of Pope Clement VII. And this publication, this new theory, was rigorously opposed by Luther, Calvin, but not only them, Zwingli and Melanchthon, we saw all that. And then the next barrage was these three philosophers, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton. We saw they were all involved in, in philosophy and, and in, in the occult. And by this time, the Reformation and belief in the Bible was severely damaged. The Reformation was basically... Uh, heading towards being dead in the water. And as we saw, it was Isaac Newton that put the final nail in the coffin for the geocentric view of the universe. He was the one that brought in the theory of gravity and the science that somehow authenticized the globe. <clears throat> but after him, we read of one man who, who, who still gave his voice, and that was John Wesley. I don't have much about him, but we, we have, we have a, a short quotation from a historian. This is from Andrew Dixon White, the same book we've referenced several times. It says, Dr. John Owen, so famous in the annals of Puritanism, declared the Copernican system a delusive and arbitrary hypothesis contrary to Scripture. So he was after Newton. You know, the Puritans were um, among a more reformed class in England. And he says, and even John Wesley declared the new ideas to tend towards infidelity. Bear in mind, John Wesley was a contemporary of Isaac Newton. He knew Isaac Newton passed away when he was young. So he would have seen the results of this, of this new, this nail in the coffin that we just saw, that this final end to the geocentric view and the, the doing away of scripture. He lived through 
the, the leading up to, and he, and he died around the time of the French Revolution. So he has a very good reason to say these sorts of things, and I'm going to show you why. Why they tend towards infidelity. Deism. Who's heard of deism? We know William Miller was a deist before his conversion. And he, you, see, you see the graphic there. It's deism, the knowledge of God based on reason and nature, not scripture. As we read here, a definition from Wikipedia. I'm going to cite a lot from this article. It's actually very interesting what, what, what we see here. It says, For deists, human beings can know God only by reason and the observation of nature, but not by revelation or by supernatural manifestations such as miracles, phenomena which deists regard with caution, if not skepticism. Deism is related to naturalism because it credits the formation of life and the universe to a higher power using only natural processes. The classical deism of the 17th and 18th centuries is a form of natural theology and denies that that, that power or God has any continuing involvement in the world. So in, for the deist, there's a God, but he's, he's, he's nowhere to be seen. And everything, everything that happens, happens just by the mechanics of nature. And now we're going to see when this theism really took off and what caused it. Theistic viewpoints emerged during the scientific revolution of the 17th century of 17th century Europe and came to exert a powerful influence during the 18th century enlightenment. That's largely about the French Revolution and the Voltaire and all these people. There were a number of different forms in the 17th and 18th centuries. In England, theists included a range of people from anti-Christian to non-Christian theists. But when it emerged during the scientific revolution of the 17th century, and that was the cause of it. That was the cause of this departure from the faith. The deism is, a, is sort of an intellectual, it has an intellectual allure, but it's really just infidelity. And, uh, but it, it appealed to the intellect, to, the, to, the, to the, uh, the upper classes of society. As we know, William Miller was an intelligent man because it had an air of uh, you know, science about it. We read here, the 17th century saw a remarkable advance in scientific knowledge. The scientific revolution, the work of Copernicus, Kepler and Galileo, set aside the old notion that the earth was the center of the universe. These discoveries posed a serious challenge to biblical and religious authorities. Galileo's condemnation for heresy being an example, in consequence, the Bible came to be seen as authoritative on matters of faith and morals, but no longer authoritative or meant to be on science. So can we see here that deism came about as a direct result of the, the findings of Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, and Isaac Newton, and all these people. This is, this is what brought about this deism. Isaac Newton, mathematical explanation of universal gravitation, explained the behavior of both of objects here on earth and of objects in the heavens in a way that promoted a worldview in which the natural universe is controlled by laws of nature. This in turn suggested a theology in which God created the universe, set in motion, controlled by natural law, and retired from the scene. The new awareness of the explanatory power of universal natural law also produced a growing skepticism about such religious staples as miracles, which are violations of natural law, and about religious books that reported them, namely the Bible. So can we see here that Isaac Newton, his work, set in motion this wholesale departure from the doctrines of Christianity, this wholesale rejection of the of the authority of the Bible. You know, the Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. We saw Isaac Newton was heavily involved in the occult. And the, the things that he brought into the world had a, had, a, had, a, had a very serious effect on people's faith. And that apple story, just um, incidentally, the apple fell on his head and he he gained this knowledge of the theory of gravity, and etc. Like, like many people said, this, didn't, this most likely didn't actually happen. But this is, an, uh, this is a Gnostic allegory. Who in the Bible got knowledge from a, from a fruit around a tree? It was Eve. Because she partook of the forbidden fruit. Likewise, Isaac Newton partook of the, the occult knowledge. Of what we're reading into those writings of Hermes Trismegistus that we saw in the other sermons. And therefore, he was given this knowledge of good and evil, this satanic uh, deception. It didn't end there. It gets worse. As we read here, the, the article continues. France had its own tradition of religious skepticism and natural theology in the works of Montaigne, Bale, and 
the most famous of the French deists was Voltaire, who acquired a taste for Newtonian science and reinforcement of deistic inclinations during a two-year visit to England during, in 1726. So Voltaire, one of the, one of the most infamous uh, Bible skeptics and atheists of all time, where did he get his ideas from? From, from Newtonian science. We read here that Professor John Leinhardt of University of Houston writes, So Voltaire took the new English science, rationalism, tempered with observation, back to France. Those ideas soon ran away from him and started a revolution beyond anything he'd ever intended. And so it was at length Isaac Newton who put the terrible disruptive engines of the French Revolution into motion. Can we see the, the, the effect that the, this science this opposition of science false so-called had upon faith in, in the scriptures and, and how it led to the French Revolution where the, where the nation declared in its legislative assembly that there was no God and it was science that caused that. French deists. French deists also included Maximilien Robespierre and Rousseau. For a short time during the French Revolution, the cult of the supreme being was the state religion of France. As many people who are versed in history know, this is from um, a quote about the French Revolution. Mortals cease to tremble before the powerless thunders of a God whom your fears have created. Henceforth acknowledge no divinity but reason or logic and science. I offer you its noblest and purest image. If you must have idols, sacrifice only such as this. Fall before the august senate, O veil of reason. This is a quote that was made in the, in the legislative assembly hall in France. A worship of reason and and it goes all the way back to this uh, science that did away with the bible that left men questioning the authority of the bible because the the truth about creation is in total opposition to newtonian copernican and, and all the science that came out of that scientific revolution so people rejected the bible and accepted science that's why their oppositions of science falsely so-called because they oppose the bible and how true are these words in Isaiah 59? And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. When truth is fallen in the street, when truth, when the truth of the word is is um, done away with, there's no judgment, there's no justice, and we, we see what happened in the reign of terror in France well, after these, uh, the French Revolution with all of its horror, which we saw. The philosophy behind the revolution, the philosophy that of Voltaire, of, of Maximilien Robespierre and all these people was largely because of their, uh, the, the Newtonian science that, that, that spawned it all. <clears throat> so how true are, are, are John Wesley's words that it tended towards infidelity. It was tended towards, towards national rejection of God and of the Bible. And we know that after the French Revolution came communism, which went off the same ideology. And uh, we know what the Communist Manifesto says. And all this was part of Satan's plan to destroy the Bible without burning it. So before the scientific revolution, back in the Dark Ages, before the Bible was given as an open book to the world, the Catholic Church kept the Bible out of reach. They locked it up or they read it in an unknown tongue. People, were, people had a respect for the Bible. They wanted to know what it said, but they were banned from knowing it. But after the scientific revolution, the Bible was in reach of everybody. But by and large, it was held as untrustworthy, as this science had, had opposed what it had said, and people had accepted the science over the Bible. So by creating all this science that went against what the Bible said, proving the Bible to be false, the devil did more to, to uh, destroy its power than by locking it up in an unknown tongue. At least before the, the Bible was given as an open book, people desired its wisdom. People, people thought it was the truth. And as we saw Cardinal Wolsey in his, in his Learning Against Learning, where he said, since printing cannot be put down, it is best to set up Learning Against Learning. Uh, and by introducing all persons to dispute, to, su to suspend the lady between fear and 
Firstly, this at most will make them attentive to their superiors and teachers. Who would never have dreamed how effective this plan would have been. And look at the people, what people are saying these days. Stephen Hawking, before we understand science, it is natural to believe that God created the universe, but now science offers a more convincing explanation. See, these are the effects of these so-called astronomers. Neil deGrasse Tyson, another, another one, he says, the, the more I look at the universe, the more I'm convinced there is no God. This is where it has led to. This is the, the shocking deaths that this, these, these oppositions of science have, have caused. And I'm sure Isaac Newton probably had no idea what he was doing. You see, the Bible, as well as liberating from sin, from vice, and from um, giving you a purer heart, it does, it does much more than that. As we read in Psalm 119, 130, The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. The Bible makes people wise in all aspects of their lives. As we saw it in the Reformation, before the Reformation, the squalor of Europe, and afterwards we had advances in, in real science, in industry, in agriculture, in standards of living, all were raised. And that's all to due to the Bible, not to, not to due to these, these silly astronomers and all their theories and foolishness. The Bible ennobles and, and gives people wisdom. And Psalm 19, the word of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The Bible, wherever it's given to the people, it liberates not only from the chains of sin, but it, it elevates and ennobles the, the, the mind. As we saw, the Waldenses were among those, the, the, the most uh, advanced people in Europe. They were the most advanced people in Europe during the Dark Ages. And the countries, the Protestant nations that accepted the Bible, like England and Germany during the Reformation, became the most prosperous, free societies that, that in, in, the, in the whole of Europe. Not to mention America, which became the, the most free and uh, prosperous country that the world has ever known. I'm not talking about the current America, but the, the, in the time of its glory. Because the Bible says, Righteousness exalteth the nation. The Bible liberates a nation, not only, from, not only the individual, but it liberates the nation from tyrannical rulers. The, the, the epitome of, of tyranny was the Dark Ages during the, when the Catholic Church locked up the Bible. Because when people, when people are ignorant, ignorant of the Bible, they're, so, they're easy to control. Ignorance is, the, is the, the, um, the greatest weapon of tyrants. The Bible makes people wise. The Bible makes people free, free thinkers. And as Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Not only from free from vice and sin, but free, uh, in, free to think for yourself, free to question, free to uh, make decisions. And, and as Cardinal Wolsey said here, the intent of the Catholic Church was to make people attentive to their superiors and teachers. Now, who were the superiors and teachers during the Dark Ages that, that people were attentive to? It was the priests. It was the priests. The, the priests were everything. They were the judge, the jury, the scientists, the scientists. The, they were everything. They controlled everyone. And they controlled them through ignorance. They controlled them through, through mind. They were controlling them in, by superstition and fear, by, by um, consequence. If you dared to say anything against what they, what they declared was the truth or, or, or what was right. So, and they kept people in ignorance of, of, of the scriptures through prohibition of it. Now, then we had the Reformation. Bible belief flourished. We had brilliant minds such as uh, Erasmus, William, uh, William Tyndale, Martin Luther. We had these men. These men were, the, the thing that I love about these men, I'm going to talk about later, was, their, was their, they were fearless. They were, they, were, they, they were free thinkers. They said what they believed and weren't afraid of consequences. And that Protestant spirit is what brought freedom. And then, we, as I stated earlier, the USA, with that, that people, when, when all the people went there, not all of them, but the majority had that, that concept of freedom and religious liberty, to, that, that, that understanding that every man is created equal and has the right to think and act for himself and act upon his convictions and say what he believes, that freedom of speech that we see eroding away before our eyes today. 
and that dark spell of ignorance that the Catholic Church threw over the world, that tyrannical society that, that, that fled away. But now, but now that is coming back. That is coming back big time. And who are today's superiors and teachers? This principle is still being used, by the way. Who are the superiors of teachers in today, of today? Who do people revere and look up to? These, these blokes, the academics, the intellectuals, the intelligentsia. These are the teachers, these are the, the priests of today, of our corrupt age. Notice the robes they're wearing. These are religious robes. These are, look at the hats, the hats they have on. These, these, all these are occult symbols. Look at this, this fellow here. He's got a, what's this here? He's got a, he's got a wizard staff. What's that? He's got their idol on the end of it. This uh, academic elite is a religion. You might call the, the globe the chief idol. You can see here the, the hats they wear. This is a mortarboard. That's what it is. It's, a, it's something that a, a mason uses to build a wall or a brick layer. So these, these men are walking tools. That's what these represents. They've been indoctrinated to build the new world order. Not that they know that. However, so if this is a religion, which, which it very much is, uh, it is something that people, it is, uh, they are the superiors and teachers that people look up to. Then what is the religion? You might call it scientism. This is, a, this is from the encyclopedia.com. It says, scientism is a philosophical position that exalts the methods of the natural sciences above all other modes of human inquiry, such as revelation, Scientism embraces only empiricism and reason to explain phenomena of any dimension, whether physical, social, cultural, or psychological. So, scientism, it's a natural science above human quote, which we saw Isaac Newton, gravity, all these sorts of things, these, these um, you know, proven scientists, sciences. Science embraces only empiricism and reason. It's, it's actually, these, th these, these theories, of these heliocentric theories and theory of gravity and all these things, uh, there's no empirical evidence for them whatsoever. We're going to discuss that a little bit later. But what they think is empiricism and reason. This is basically a, a, a religion. And this religion reveres scientific authority. We saw professors, scientists, the wisdom of men. The mentality of this kind of uh, thinking, it says, is that if science has proved it, it must be true. You know, that you've heard these things. The science is settled. The science is settled. We've... We've, we've proven that climate change is real, etc. And then everyone has to accept that or else, you know, or else you're uh, scoffed, ridiculed, etc. We've all been guilty of this. You know, we've all been, we've all, we've all just like taken people's word for it. We've, we'll, 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 you can't really blame people from the day we're born. We're put in front of a globe, showing about how, you know, everything revolves around the sun and etc. So, but we've all been, we've all fallen for this one. But we didn't do the experiments. We didn't analyze the data. We just accepted it because science said it was true. So that's, that's, what you can, that's how we can understand this scientism. We have accepted it upon the authority of those who have given it to us, which goes all the way back, as we've seen, to Copernicus, Newton, and all these people. And this not just goes for cosmology, but medicine, education, even the mainstream media are part of this and we're trained from infancy to think this way, or not to think, really. It's a, a form of mind control, controlled by fear. Here's a, here's a um, you might call it a, a creed of, of scientism today. I thought this was a joke when I first saw it, but it's actually not. This is a meme that actually went around on the internet. And people are passing this around as, as though it's, it's their belief. And you can see Earth is not flat, vaccines work, we've been to the moon, chemtrails aren't a thing, climate change is real, stand up for science, you know. Oh, I was shocked when I saw this because I thought it was a joke. All these things I know are, are wrong. But this is the, this is, these are the things. I, I put the or else there. You know, what happened? You know, but or else, you, I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to show how, how people... Respond when you disagree with these things. We, we all know from experience how people respond when you, when you say anything against this creed. They feel insulted. They get angry with you. It just proves more of that it's this occult mentality. 
it's uh it's religious it's spiritual let's just see a little video we interviewed Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the environmentalist, here at the People's Climate March in 2014, mm -hmm. September. He said that the climate deniers, his word, and energy CEOs belong at The Hague with three square meals and a cot with all the other war criminals. What is your thought on that? And do you think some of the rhetoric on your side, as I'm sure both sides, but some of the rhetoric on your side gets too carried away? I mean, you don't, what's your thought on jailing skeptics as war criminals? Well, uh, if the, we'll see what happens. Uh, was it appropriate to jail the guys from Enron? Interesting. Like, okay, right. So we'll see what happens. If was it appropriate to jail people from the cigarette industry who insisted who insisted that this addictive product was not addictive and so on. And you think about in these cases, for me as a taxpayer and voter, uh, the doubting the introduction of this extreme doubt, will you go with extreme doubt about climate change, is affecting my quality of life as a public citizen. So I can see where People are very concerned about this and are pursuing criminal investigation. He said, do you, think, do you think it's going too far to say we should put climate change deniers in jail? He said, no, we'll see what happens. He agrees with that. So, so you can see where this um, scientific uh, cult, it, it, they, they seek to even control people's thoughts. This is a thought, thought crime to, to even speak against climate change. And they, they, this is one of the things they're using, you know, they're going to use to destroy freedom of speech. But you see people's um, animosity towards you if, you if you say anything against their, their creed here. And that's, what, that's why um, this is so dangerous. Now, there's a difference between scientism and science. Scientism is a, is a philosoph philosophical... Uh, theoretical um, uh, religion, but science is is a provable and practical, and not just theoretical. Number one rule with true science: it will not disagree with revelation, will not disagree with God's word. But that doesn't mean it's it's confined to revelation. But it's always practical. It's always something you can prove, something you can see. That's something that does something. It's not just merely the theoretical like all these other things. Now, this is Nikola Tesla. Some of you may have heard of him, some of you may have not. He has been written out of history for, for the reason that he uh, went against all these um, scientism-minded people. Some of the things he said we're going to show in a second. Now, he invented the radio. It wasn't Marconi, it was him. He invented remote control, electric motors. He, he gave AC electricity to people's homes. Every one of us has an induction motor under our bonnets of our cars that, he, that is an invention of his. Um, I actually learn about, I learn all about the battle between AC electricity and DC electricity in physics in high school, but they didn't mention Nikola Tesla, who was the one that actually pioneered it. They, they, read, they wrote him out of history because he was a real scientist. He wasn't one of these quacks like Einstein. And what he says here, Today's scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments and they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. He's talking about Einstein here specifically. But you can talk about it as well. They substitute theories for experiments by, by um, suppositions, assumptions, and then they wander off through equation after equation. So they build another assumption on the, a previous assumption, and then they just, it's the a whole structure has no relation to reality, such as this, for example, you've got the heliocentric model, then to make the heliocentric model plausible, they invent the theory of gravity, all mass attracts all mass, and then from that you've got the Big Bang, somehow the mass all condensed and exploded and formed planets, the Big Bang, and then from space dust, dust particles came to Earth, created the, the apes, and became human beings. But all these things are related to each other, but they're all just assumptions. They're not, they're totally uh, improved. Imp they, they have their unproven theories and they just wander off and it's got no relation to reality. It's a total fiction, a total fantasy. They build a theory on theory. And here we have this uh, scientist, Albert Einstein. 
after we have all these theories that, that have no relation to reality, he came up with all these strange things. This is part of his theory of relativity, such as uh, space and time are, are one continuum called space-time, whatever that means. Gravity bends light. This phenomenon is called gravitational lensing. See, uh, the assumption of gravity that's never been proven somehow bends light now. And this one that they taught me about in physics in high school. Time does not pass at the same rate for everyone. A fast-moving observer measures time passing more slowly than a relatively stationary observer would. This phenomenon is called time dilation. Yeah, see, it's just, it's just madness. The, the, I remember in high school they taught me this, this thing that if you got on a rocket and you went and traveled at the speed of light around the universe, and then when you came back, if you came back in, in a year, you would be young and everyone else would be old. Because, because when you travel at the speed of light, you don't age as fast. It's just, it's just madness. You know, it's, it's, there's no difference between science fiction and, and this scientism. That's what they call science. It's, it's crazy. And I love what Nikola Tesla said there because it's so, it's so true. Einstein's theory of relativity is a magnificent mathematical garb which fascinates, dazzles, and makes people blind to the underlying errors. The theory is like a beggar clothed in purple whom ignorant people take for a king. Its exponents are brilliant men, but they are metaphysicists rather than scientists. So what are metaphys me metaphorical physicists? It's metaphorical. It doesn't, it's not real. It's, it's make-believe. It's, it's, a, it's a fiction. It's just a t it's fantasy. And this is from a man who can say these things because he was a real scientist. He, he, invented, he invented pretty much everything, everything we, we use every day. He has the authority to, to, to say this. And no wonder he was white from history when he said things like this, touching their sacred cow. And this, I, love the, I love this scripture. I think it's fitting, fitting here. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. But the lips of a fool swallow up himself. The beginning of, his, of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. The beginning of this is foolishness, spinning globe model. And look at the mischievous madness that we've ended up with now. It's just, it has no relation to reality at all. <clears throat> and it's mischievous because, as we saw earlier, it tended towards infidelity. It made infidels out of the entire intellectual classes of Europe and now the entire world. It all comes back to this scientism that began with Copernicus, goes even further back to the, the Magi. The way this works, we know that the, the Catholic Church worked by uh, keeping people ignorant, you know, saying that they were the, the God's, God's vessels in this world and you had to listen to us or you're anathema, you're going to hell, etc. They brought you into submission through, through their authority. And it's the same way that this scientism works too, because the things that they say are so ridiculous and nonsensical, like, like these things, that you just, they're so opposed to common sense and any practical reason that you just have to accept it upon their authority. You just have to submit to them. You have to bow down your intellect to them because they know more than you. They're smarter than I am. So it's a, it's a forcing into submission through this intellectual philosophy. They say the science is settled. If you disagree, then you know, you're unscientific, you're a fool. You know, and, and from our earliest years, our free thought has been suppressed and paralyzed through the public school system we went through. We've been, we've been taught just to regurgitate things. And that's why, that's why the, accepting something like the flat earth, like the biblical cosmology is so hard for people because, because it's, it just goes against everything that the way they've been trained to think. Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister of Nazi Germany, said this, propaganda works best when those being manipulated are confident they are acting on their own free will. The people attack this flat earth teaching that God is bringing back, thinking that they're you know, acting from their own intelligence. It's because it insults your, your conception so badly that you attack this, your initial, all of us, our initial response to when we hear this is that's, that's crazy, that's ludicrous. But that's, that's because we've been brainwashed our entire lives. And people, think we, people, when they attack this, think that they're acting intelligently when if they actually looked at how crazy the, the heliocentric model and everything that comes with it is, 
if they actually stopped and looked, it's it's crazy. But but they have been so we've been so paralyzed through the propaganda over the years. And we feel like it's our own thought, like we actually understand it when it's total nonsense. It's a bit like the Trinity. And people are too afraid to speak up for fear of reprisal. But there always has been flat earthers. People think that this is a new thing, but there hasn't. It's not a new thing at all. There has always been flat earthers, always been people that have stood up for the biblical account of cosmology. We see Zetetic Astronomy. 1848, and we see all these books here. There's plenty more than this. I haven't, I haven't read all these books. I've read a couple of these too, but I just grabbed a few examples that will fit on the slide to show you that throughout history, there's always been flat earthers. It's not something that has just come up. And their arguments have, all, have been based from Scripture. All these people base their arguments in Scripture and from empirical evidence. Not dazzling theoretical garbage like, like, like uh, we saw with Einstein and these other people and mathematical equations, but, empir but empirical solid things, solid evidence, things we can all do. Alex Gleason, who wrote this book here, The Earth from Heaven, his Bible from Heaven is The Earth, the Globe. He was a blacksmith. He was a practical man. He worked with his hands. And you can see it expressed in the way he writes, the way he writes things that you can all do, you can all understand. It's not just theory, like, like um, the scientism likes to push. Now, I thought it was interesting how it says here that scientism he embraces only empiricism and reason. The flat earth believer has ample empirical evidence to support their belief. What is empirical, by the way? We'll see here. Empirical based on or concerned with or verifiable by observation or experience rather than theory or pure logic. So empirical evidence is experimental evidence. You can verify yourself by your own experience. The flat earther has plenty of empirical evidence. The, the heliocentric model has, has none, has nothing, zero. And it's for this reason that throughout history, the proponents of the heliocentric model and the, the, the pushers of this scientism ideology have sought to prove that the motion of the earth this the Mickelson Morley experiment another thing we all we all many of us would have seen it learned about in high school I, learned, I remember learning about this one anyway the real reason they did this experiment was to detect the motion of the earth which is what they don't tell you at school they they figured that since the earth is moving and they had this they had the speed of light and they were going to point, point the beam in one direction and then measure how long it took to bounce off the mirrors and come back. Then they'll point it in another direction. And then because of the Earth's moving, the speed of light should be relative to the, the motion of the Earth and you should get a different reading. Anyway, they got a zero result. They got a negative result. They didn't detect any motion whatsoever. So there's a strike against their uh, seeking empirical evidence. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Operation High Jump. I believe they did find some empirical evidence here, but... It, it's not the evidence they were looking for, not the one that they desired. Now, Operation High Jump happened after the Second World War. It was officially titled the, the United States Navy Arctic Developments Program. It was the 1946-47. It was organized by Rear Admiral Byrd. So just after the Second World War, this Admiral Byrd took a whole bunch of ships and men, went down to Antarctica. Now, there's... There's not much let on about this operation. They don't want to let us know what they actually found. Some odd confessions of Admiral Byrd, who died not long after this, um, are worth looking into. But what they did next tells me that they did find something. Here's the Operation High Jump. You can see here the high jump that they had to um, get over to get to where they were looking for. They, they had to get over the ice wall. After this operation, not a little long after 10 years, the agreement was signed by 12 nations in which the Antarctic continent was made a demilitarized zone to be preserved for scientific research. The treaty resulted from the conference in Washington, D.C., attended by representatives from these countries, and later, later other nations acceded to the treaty. After this time, 
very heavy restrictions have been imposed upon Antarctica. You can fly, to, fly there, but they take you to a sp very specific location, like, like when you go to North Korea. They take you to a, all the places where they want you to go and they don't let you go anywhere else. That's what they do in Antarctica. They don't allow independent exhibitions. They're virtually impossible. There's so much red tape and money you've got to pay before you actually even get... Um, uh, they actually look at your proposal because the pretense is that you might tread on a penguin or something. There's no country on earth that has the restrictions that Antarctica has. They're hiding something there. And as a flat earth believer, I, I, can, I can see what it is. It's the ice ring. It's, and, and beyond that, the dome, which, which uh, goes obviously over the earth from there. The fact that they made this treaty after, after discovering the dome is, just shows that they're hiding something. More evidence of that. Not long after, in, in, where is this? in 1962, they began Operation Fishbowl. Operation Fishbowl was a series of high-altitude nuclear tests in 1962 that were carried out by the United States uh, as part of a larger Operation Dominic nuclear test program. So what they did during Operation Fishbowl is fire nuclear weapons up high up high levels in the atmosphere. Now, why would they do that after, after going to Antarctica? Evidently, they discovered the dome in Antarctica, and then they wanted to see how high up it went or if they could destroy it, break a hole in it. Now, that may sound a little bit far-fetched, but just look at the name of the operation, Operation Fishbowl. And that was a part of a larger operation called Operation Dominic. What does Operation Dominic mean? Of the Lord. Fishbowl of the Lord. Sound, uh, you know, too coincidental? I don't think so. Looks a lot like a fishbowl. They can see why they would, why they would um, call it that. And you can see here that missiles were released and detonated at 248 miles, supposedly. You can see some of the glow of, on, the, on the high levels of the atmosphere or maybe the dome there, the, some of the explosions happening. And apparently the Soviets were doing this, were simultaneously doing a similar operation. So since they, had, they still have no empirical evidence, but rather evidence to the contrary, that's why NASA was created shortly after. NASA was created, established in 1958, we see, just, just at the same time as all these things were happening. Because Nick, Nixon famously said, the American public don't believe anything until they see it on television. So obviously... They believe everything they see on television. People say they don't, but they really, really, the television has a large, a big um, influence on people, the way people believe. And they, this is what they got to see on television. Now, I've known for years, or I believe for years, that this was, this, the moon landing was fake. Probably many people who have been interested in the truth movement, so to speak, have known this for a long time. But... I could never work out why. I thought, oh yeah, maybe it's you know, just some way of glorifying man, which I, it was. But after finding out this truth about the, the, the nature of the earth, I, I realized the real reason for it. It was to prove the heliocentric model, to prove the globe, because they never had any empirical evidence for it before this. Now they still don't. But... Now I could show you the saturation levels and how this uh, square box comes around the earth here. I could show you pictures of this Lunar module, how it looks like it's made from tinfoil, curtain rods, and scotch tape. I could, I could um, show the flag waving on the moon. All those things are very interesting. I'm not going to uh, clutter the sermon with those. I recommend looking into them if you're interested in it. But what we'll do is just get it straight from the horse's mouth that they never went to the moon. Uh, this will be from the second man that supposedly landed on the moon, Buzz Aldrin. And listen to what he says. Why has nobody been to the moon in such a long time? <laughs> That's not a, an eight-year-old's question. <laughs> That's my question. I want to know, but I think I know. Because we didn't go there and and that's the way it happened. And, and if it didn't happen, it's nice to know why it didn't happen. So in the future, if we want to keep doing something, 
we need to know why something stopped in the past that we wanted to keep it going. But I think I know. Because we didn't. Because we didn't. Because we didn't. So he tells this little girl that they didn't go to the moon. He says we didn't go. That's straight from his mouth. Whether it was from a pang of conscience, he didn't want to lie to a child, but that's what he said it. So we don't have to analyze the things when they, when they admit it outright. Another good question is why, why haven't they been back? If they went in you know, 1969, why, why haven't they been back since then? You know, that, that was one other question I had. But let's ask, let's ask an astronaut from NASA and let him explain it to us. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. But going to Mars should be uh, one of the next series of steps that... Did you hear what he said? <laughs> we, 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 we destroyed that technology? from 50 years ago? It doesn't make any sense. But what about the pictures from space? You know, this is, this, is, this is probably why most people believe in the globe, because we've seen the pictures. Now, this is a picture of the blue marble. NASA would have you believe they are real photographs, because that's what they suppose everyone is going to think when they see them, but they actually admit that they're not. This man here, Robert Simmon, he, he is the creator of the blue marble. This is from NASA's website in the section here. He says, then we wrapped the flat map around a ball. My part was integrating the surface clouds and oceans to match people's expectations of how the earth looks from space. That ball became the famous blue model, marble. After the, he previously says about how they took it from satellites, etc. I don't believe they took it from satellites. But he's admitting that this is not a photo. We think it's a photo, but it's not. They actually admit that they wrapped a flat map around a ball. Um, the only, the only, uh, <clears throat> there's one that they actually say is a photo. It's the original one from 1972 or something. But all the others, they actually admit are, are CGI that are photoshopped, as he says here. So some of those are painted on. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's has to be. Then there was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just take Command Z a lot. There's artistry to creating the world. It, what I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space, but I've looked at these images over and over again, trying to sort of get the essence of it. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. So the creator of these photos admits that they're photoshopped because it has to be. Why does it have to be? Obviously, obviously they can't get high enough to take a photo of it. He he said that it's how he imagines it to be. They they went to the moon, didn't they? We saw the moon picture, the, the, look how far away they are. Certainly they could get a photo of, of the, a full photo of the Earth without stitching a dozen photos together or how many they do. And just here's some of the ridiculous pictures they produce. This is their official image from 2012. Look how big America is there from 2013. See how small it is. You know, th this is actually the thing that made me start looking into the flat Earth was the, the discrepancies of the scale in these pictures. They're obviously fake. There's three satanic references in this logo. That red forked tongue, definitely certainly a reference to the serpent. This is Ouroboros. You see the this, this snake chasing its tail here. This is an occult symbol that people may be familiar with. And the other one is the name itself. NASA in Hebrew means to beguile, deceive, lead astray, to delude, morally seduce, as we see in the Genesis 3.13. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me. And I did, this word beguiled is NASA. Mm -hmm. Can that all be coincidence? Absolutely not. The devil really uh, likes the, the, the number three. 
we've seen that they have no empirical evidence. They had to uh, make all these photoshopped images and fake the moon landing to try to obtain any. But what about the flat Earth, the, the, the called biblical cosmology? Does that have empirical evidence? This is from Alex Gleason's book. I took a photo of it this morning. This is a balloon here and the way that your eyes work. And he says here, this is what the balloonist said. The horizon always appeared on a level with the car, the, the balloon car. So the horizon rises with you all the time. And this other testimony from a, a balloonist says, the chief peculiarity of a view from a balloon at a considerable elevation was the altitude of the horizon, which remained practically on a level with the eye at an elevation of two miles, causing the surface of the earth to appear concave, that means like a dish, instead of convex, and to recede during the rapid ascent whilst the horizon and the balloon seem to be stationary. So the horizon always rises to meet you. It always rises. We've all been up in a plane and we know, we know the horizon is always on eye level because that's the way our eyes work. Our vision is limited to a sphere. The extent of our vision is where we can no longer focus. That's the vanishing point. Now, if, if the earth was a globe, you would expect not, not a, a dish to come, but you would expect it to be like that, to, to fall away. But this is what we see. This is what we see. And this is just proves that the earth is, is not a sphere. See, these are practical experiments. This is real empirical evidence that, that can be verified by the, by the observer. We don't need to go up in a space shuttle or you know, do a whole bunch of mathematics. We can all see this for ourselves. Just another photo showing that as you go up, the sphere of your vision, the limit of your vision changes to, to a different sphere. That's the limit of our eyes. Our eyes have a, a vanishing point. You know, when you look down a hallway or down a road, everything goes to a convergence point. That's why we see the sunset. That's why the sun looks like it goes down. Everyone's watched a plane go overhead that flies over and it seems like it's the highest above us at the top. And as it goes down, it seems to go lower. The plane's still flying at 35,000 feet, but it appears to, to descend to go down but it, until it vanishes from our view. But this is just perspective. It's just everything reaching a convergence point. That's how we can understand the sun goes down, but the sun actually doesn't go down. It just appears to go down. It stays at the same height like the airplane does until it drops out of our field of view. It um, vanishes in that vanishing point where our eyes max out, where light maxes out for us to be seen. This illustration shows that. And there's another one coming where we see here. The bottom one is what we see, but that's what the sun's really doing. But because of perspective, because everything vanishes into the vanishing point, it appears to set. These are empirical evidences that we can all understand because we can, we've all seen a plane go over our head and dip over the horizon but when it's still flying at 35,000 feet. Is there any empirical evidence for the motion of the Earth? For the, for the sun, the Earth spinning and orbiting the sun and, and traversing the universe? Before we, before we show what the Bible says about that. Let's show what the heliocentric model actually teaches. Because like when people, you teach people about the Trinity, they don't actually know what they believe. I think a lot of heliocentrists don't actually know the details of what they believe. This is what they believe, or what the, the model states anyway, that Earth rotates on its axis at, at over a thousand miles per hour at the poles. The Earth orbits the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. The sun and the solar system move at 448,000 miles per hour and the Milky Way galaxy moves at 1.3 million miles per hour. So the Earth is actually being dragged around this with, by the sun throughout this, the galaxy. Now with these, this at least four different directions, you'd think we'd notice some movement. You'd think you'd experience, you'd think you'd have some empirical evidence of that motion. And look at the um, amazing speeds. But do we feel anything? I don't feel a thing. And the Bible is vindicated by that fact. As the Bible says, Fear before him all the earth, the world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. So stable you can balance rocks and change positions like that. See, the, there's no empirical evidence for the motion of the earth. But for me, one of the greatest is this one. We just saw there's four different motions here. If there were so many varied motions of, of the planet, would we see stars do this? 
Now this is a time-lapse photo of the stars at night. And that star in the middle is Polaris. That one doesn't move. All the others do perfect circles around Polaris. And you can see the traces there. Now if the world was spinning, if it was just a globe that was spinning with, uh, while everything else was stationary, this could make sense. But there's four different motions here that we're seeing. Those stars should be doing all sorts of crazy things if there's, if there's all those motions. They shouldn't be making perfect circles, which they have done day after day, year after year, millennia after millennia. That's why the Bible says that they're for signs of for seasons. That because they're, people, they're, they're, they're uh, dependable. They're always doing the same thing. They're not, they're not moving all over the place like they would if you were you know, traversing the galaxy. They'd be all zigzagging and crazy, but they're doing perfect circles. This for me is, 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 is probably the greatest empirical evidence that the heavens revolve and we are stable. And just imagine, look, look at it superimposed on top of that. You're supposed to get perfect circles when this is things doing that around the, around the universe? Impossible. It's over. So why is this important? What, what does this matter? What does it matter for me? For me, these things matter simply because it's the truth. It matters because it's the truth, because it's in the Word of God. God put things in His Word so we would believe them. And the Bible says that it is a lo the love of the truth is the one and only thing that will save a soul. I was reading 2 Thessalonians. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So the people that, that aren't saved, they don't receive the love of the truth. They don't love the truth. Therefore, the inverse is true. Those who receive the truth and the love of it, they're the ones that are saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It's important because if it's the truth, it's important. It's as simple as that. And we saw that the people that brought the heliocentric model, like NASA and Copernicus, were all agents of Satan. And the result, the results of the, of, of the science they brought in destroyed the authority of the scriptures. It destroyed the Reformation. And, it is, and, and now we see the state of the world with the uh, unbelief and infidelity has become like a second Sodom. And we can, we can truly attribute this to false conceptions, to wrong ideology, to, um, a, to a, just the rejection of the Bible. As we saw before, truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. That's, it's when truth is lost that, that um, there's no justice, there's no ju judgment. Now, I'm almost finishing up. We're finishing up soon. Now, as I, as I inferred to, I mentioned before, what I love about the reformers is their fearlessness. The reformers didn't think of consequences. They didn't worry What's going to happen if, if I accept this? What, what, what do people think of me? What do, uh, what's going to happen to our church? If they thought like that, there would have been no reformation. We'd still all be in the dark ages. But what did they say? We see Martin Luther here. He says, I cannot and will not recant anything for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. Amen. See, they didn't worry about the consequences. They, found, they, they heard the truth. They found it. They found what it is. They loved it and they ran with it. And that's what God's people need to do today. People, are def people will mock you, certainly. But that, um, that should not be any, of any surprise to us. William Tyndale, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life here many years, I will cause... The boy that drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. See, I love the zeal and the power of these people. The, I love the, um, the boldness of them. You know, these people were, were free thinkers. They wouldn't be bound. They wouldn't be uh, compelled to yield. They wouldn't be made to fear the authorities. And that's the kind of spirit that God's people need in the last days. They shouldn't be a shouldn't be enslaved to fear or consequences. Tyndale said this, If they shall burn me, they shall do none other than I look for. William Tyndale hated this world and 
martyrdom to him would only show the satanic malice of his enemies. Scoffing at this message of, of, of the biblical cosmology, cosmology vindicates it because it, it, it shows the wrath of the dragon. And we're seeing a lot of scoffing against this, not only from the world, but from, from God's professed people. And um, this passage from Scripture foretold this very thing that's happening today. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3 says this, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, See, these scoffers, we're going we're gonna to build upon on the picture of, of who these people are. Firstly, they're, scoff, they're scoffers. They're walking after their own lust. They're following their own inclination. And they're not following the word of God. A little bit more about them. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So now more we, more we see about them. They believe in the coming of Jesus. Since the, they believe in fathers, they have, they have a heritage, a Christian heritage. And here they say all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So they're even creationists. These are not the world people. We know that we saw Bill Nye, we saw, we saw these um, Stephen Hawking, and these, but this, this is not talking about them. They are scoffers, but this, these are talking about God's people. They believe in his coming. They believe in it. They're creationists. It's in the last days. And it's in the last days that we see here. In the last days, scoffers. More about them. Peter only, only gives us one indication or one identifying point that they're, that they're willing to eager. One thing about their theology, he points out. He says here, for this they are willingly ignorant of. What does it mean to be willingly ignorant? It doesn't mean to just, just be, be, um, you, un, be unknown to you. To be willingly ignorant, you have to have first come in contact with something and rejected it. You have to have made a decision not to believe something. And what is it that they're willingly ignorant of? That by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So they're ignorant of the first thing, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. That's a clear reference to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 6, where, it said, where he says, and God said, by the word of God, and God said, the, the, the certain parallel there and God said let there be a ferment in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters by the word of God the heavens were of old what Peter's talking about there is the ferment that God spoke into existence that ferment that that ferment that rakia that thing that solid uh, barrier that actually was so solid it could divide and hold up waters from from the waters below it's not air he's talking about it's a solid ferment that David says is still there, Psalm 148. So they're, they're wilf, they, they, they reject the ferment. And what else? That they reject and that the earth standing out of the water and in the water. This is no doubt another reference to Genesis 1, where God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one, unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. In the Genesis account, the earth sits upon the waters of the great deep. And we read in Psalm 24, David illustrates this and he says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and them that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. And it was, as we see in the diagram, which, which is modeled off what the Bible says, the earth is actually f sitting upon waters and by its pillars, as 1 Samuel says, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he that has set the world upon them. So what Peter is saying here is that they're willing and ignorant of is that the earth is standing out of the water and in the water. The earth is actually literally sitting in the water by the power of God. These last day scoffers are ignorant of that fact. Amazing the, the things that, that you see when light comes on a subject. Just to summarize, these last day, last, in the last days there are creationists claiming to be God's people, claiming to wait for the second coming, but they reject the Genesis of one account of creation, which, which the only... Way you can reject that is to accept the spinning globe model. Incredible. Now this is our last verse here. The loud cry of the angel we read about in Revelation 18 joins the three angels' messages, where the, and the earth is lightened with, the, with God's glory when that message goes out. And what does Revelation 14 say? The message that they're continuing it says, 
saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. Now the people that give that final message, that give the primary uh, application to that message in the very last days, I think they're going to know what these things are, heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of water. They're going to know that it's the, the biblical description. We've seen the origin of this, of this theory that comes from heathen philosophy. We've seen the damage and destruction it's done to faith in God's word in this, in the, after the scientific revolution and how the enemies of the truth have desperately tried to prove their, their um, theory with these false things of NASA and all these lies. But thank God that this truth is coming back and that uh, many people around the world are seeing this, not, not only from among, among, well, among, among us, but people in other faiths and even people in the world are coming to see this just through the empirical evidence and through the lies they are coming to know the truth. I believe that this, this truth is going to have a, a give great, give great um, energy to the work. It's going to bring many people because there, there's plenty of people that love the truth out there that when they see this, they're going to, they're going to continue and on as the light that shineth more and more into the perfect day and embrace the, the true light of the, the things that we've known for many years. So I, my prayer is that, that many other people um, start to share these things. If, if we're convicted of these things, we have to be like the reformers. We have to stand, like Martin Luther says, here I stand, I can do no other. We're not to put our light under our bushel, but we're to, to, to share it with the world. And it's such a beautiful truth that, that, that you can't help but love studying. And, and my, my hope and prayer is that, that um, God's people can, can really run with this and we can, um, and, and no doubt there will be a great blessing that comes from it. So I invite you to kneel with me as we close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for, we thank you for the, this, uh, this day and we thank you so much for making thy words so clear and so plain. We thank you for bringing back the truth about what you really created, that you created that dome to protect us and that you, um, as we know from other passages that you're not far away you're just above us watching us and you have been watching over humanity since the beginning and that thought brings great joy to our hearts and we just pray that you'll you'll help us to be brave and and uh, and stand lord as individuals and and as churches that we might have the courage to take a stand and 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 not be afraid to as the reformers did and to defend your truth to to um, confess it and of love for it, for we know that those are the only people that will be in your presence eternally, those that love truth, that those that have the courage to stand for it, as, as we saw brave William Tyndale did to his death. And we just ask that you'll imbue us all with that same spirit, we pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>